So welcome everybody um, to uh, our bi-weekly virtual plant clinic. I was actually on uh, last week, to, uh, last two weeks ago uh, with David. Once again, I'm not Sally. Uh, Sally was here for our webinar this morning with Peg, um, but she wasn't able to be here for this afternoon's plant clinic. Uh, so you guys have to suffer through me again. I apologize. Um, but my name is Daniel Cap, and then I'm one of the marketing people here. And once again, we have David uh, Yost, who's been with us for, was it almost 30 years now? Uh, don't rush me. 25, but I'm working. 25 years. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, so a couple house, uh, so, so uh, uh, David's gonna be doing uh, a uh, plant clinic today on uh, growing vegetables and herbs. And then uh, uh, we'll be doing a lot of uh, some questions and answers afterwards. Just a couple of uh, house cleaning uh, things, housekeeping things for people who have not been on here before. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, which is different from a Zoom meeting. That means that um, while you can see David and I, um, we cannot see you or hear you, but you are able to ask questions. Uh, at, usually at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A tab. There's also a chat tab. Um, both of those you can ask questions in. Um, and at the end of the presentation, um, David, uh, uh, I'll be giving David some of the questions. For anybody who is not, who had a question that didn't get it answered, um, you can reach out to Sally Burrows at sburrows at mgcmail.com um, or through myself through the contact us form on our website, which is www.maryfieldgardencenter.com. Uh, I think that is about it. I'll probably remember something later, but uh, for now, uh, I think David, why don't you take it away? All right. All right, Daniel. Good to be back together with you again after the last, <laughs> uh, we did that show a couple of weeks ago. I appreciate all the help and support uh, that, that makes this happen. Of course, uh, Daniel does helps me a lot with the technical stuff too. He's always there behind the scenes, getting things loaded up and fielding emails and questions. So definitely a team effort here. But most of all, thank you everybody for joining me on this chilly April afternoon. Uh, who thought we'd be here with, uh, at least in my house, they were looking like 37 degrees last night. They're still again talking about like 35 degrees tonight temperatures in the 50s but hey that's the way it is around here right in Virginia you say if you don't like the weather just wait it will change so I'm talking to you about one of my favorite topics today which is growing vegetables and herbs I think this has just uh, got to be one of the most rewarding and satisfying aspects of gardening growing vegetables often takes a little more attention of uh, I don't want to say it's, it's more work, but it's something that you definitely do need to go and check on almost daily. But as you get into this, it's like you want to go check on them daily uh, kind of thing. So things can change quickly in the vegetable garden. Uh, so it takes that effort, but it is well worth the time and effort, the rewards and satisfaction that you have of being able to take literally the fruits of your labor and put it on the table to enjoy yourself, to share with others, participate in the process of producing your own food. It's just so gratifying. It gives you so much appreciation for what it takes to produce the food that we consume. Uh, I just can't say enough about uh, doing it and encouraging you to make a little bit of time and space in your garden. You don't have to go into a full blown, you know, 50 by 50 garden or anything like that. Uh, like myself, you know, I'm just talking about, I have go a few things in pots or containers, maybe spot a thing or two in my garden. So no matter how big or small, just make sure you do something. I've kind of shared this story before, but I started here 25 years ago. And when I first came to Maryfield, uh, and again, the days, and hopefully we'll get back there when we were doing in-person seminars. Uh, of course, right away, I went to start offering classes on growing vegetables and herbs. And back at that time, really not exaggerated when I said we would offer our seminars. And I would typically get anywhere from five to 10 people show up. If I had a dozen people show up, that was like a huge success. That's about as much as we could get to arrive. And, and our classes more in ornamental gardening, you know, we get a hundred people showing up to give you an idea of the scale. So it was just a, for me, it's a weird time because there just wasn't any interest in it. But then as what I think happened was kind of the celebrity chef movement. I, I give kudos to the food people. 
all the celebrity chef movements and the TV shows that they started putting on, they're using uh, fresh ingredients, organic ingredients, um, unusual ingredients that you may not be able to find at your local produce stand or markets. And I think that really stirred an interest in people wanting to grow their own vegetables and herbs so they would have it available to them in the kitchen. And so this part of gardening really started expanding. And we went back to responding to that more and offering the classes, attendance picked up, you know, success builds on success, more people were doing it. When the pandemic showed up, lots of people, then suddenly lots and lots of people start putting in raised garden beds, containers, because they had the time at home. And so this is one of these aspects of gardening that has really taken off for us the last few years. So I've got just um, too much information to fit into one program, but I'm gonna try anyway. So I'm gonna race through a bunch of stuff about growing vegetables. Have pen and paper handy because uh, you'll probably need to take some notes. Uh, and then I'm going to go through quickly with the intention of holding at least 10 minutes or so uh, open at the end for questions. So just kind of kick things off. I think as a general understanding, I really want everybody to understand that we take um, vegetables and herbs and we're going to split them into this uh, either cool season or warm season vegetables. So we have many, many, I would say probably even more vegetables and herbs that are going to thrive during cool temperatures. So here I'm talking about things like broccoli, cabbage, lettuce, peas, cilantro, parsley, uh, cauliflower, you know, the list goes on and on, Swiss chard, kale, it, it goes a lot of things that thrive when temperatures are about this 50 to 75 degrees, and many of those will withstand a light frost. So here in Virginia, uh, we have kind of a short spring season. So with our cool season vegetables, we want to get a jump on things and start those sometimes as early as March. And we're trying to take advantage that it's March, April, into May time period to grow these cool season vegetables. So right now, as we go into the end of April, we're kind of late on getting into these. So I'm really not gonna speak to the cool season vegetables. That's something that we probably should have had a conversation about maybe a, a month ago. There are a few things that you could try to start now, but basically I'm telling you, it's, it's, we're, we're getting late. And if you really want to grow some of those, then come talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. But what I do want to talk to you about mostly today are the warm season vegetables. This is the stuff that everybody loves. You know, this, we're talking about tomatoes, peppers, um, melons, cucumbers. Um, these, these really thrive under warm conditions. As you can see there, they want soil temperatures. They're in like 70 to, to 90 degrees. They love it when it's warm outside. And we're quite honestly, we're not quite there yet. Uh, so just like we're experiencing right now, where we're still having some nighttime temperatures in the 30s and only hitting the highs in the 50s uh, for the next few days, we're a little bit early to get started on these. So what I'm trying to do is really uh, build the, the knowledge, the interest. You can come in, you can buy some of your warm season vegetables, uh, you can purchase your seeds, you can be planting out your garden, you can get everything going. But I generally don't want to actually start planting these until we get into May. So I'm hoping by next week, uh, we might actually be able to get these things into the garden where they'll thrive with a little bit warmer soil conditions. The next thing I'm gonna say in terms of getting prepared for your garden, it's worth every bit of time, money, and effort you invest into the soil that's going to reward you with more and more produce. Because we are demanding from these plants higher production, higher yield, we want them to flower, produce juicy fruit for us we can harvest, to put on the table, and we want to maximize that. We want to maximize the growing conditions and maximize a good, healthy garden soil. So quickly, I'm going to cover just what I call growing good soil. Uh, a good soil is something that looks like this image. It's going to be dark in color. It's going to be crumbly in texture. 
this allows air and water to, to filter through there that has uh, the ability to hold both moisture and oxygen that the plants need to grow and thrive. Uh, you'll notice that dark coloration that will be loaded with nutrients. And that's basically our red clay is anything but this. So clay soil that many of us work with, it's got high water holding capacity, high nutrient holding capacity, but it's just the sheer density of it. It gets, it gets hard, it doesn't allow air and water to penetrate through there, and that's what really limits some of our crop production. The way we get from just sort of red clay to a nice crumbly soil, it's a biological process. There's a world of life underneath our feet. We just don't see it. I like this little chart because it kind of shows the smaller the organisms, the more abundant they become. This is what is going on underneath our feet. So you and me, we might be able to see visually down to about the third tier, fourth tier. I can actually, if I squint really hard and, and look closely, I might be able to see a, a, a mite, uh, but that's the size of like a little speck of pepper. When we start going below that, when we get down to the nematodes and protozoa and the bacteria and, and all the things and the fungi that live down in the soil, they are there by the trillions. When I look at that bacteria, I'm looking at it, so hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions per square meter. So the soil should be just full of life, teeming with life. And it's all this life that occurs underneath our feet that make this system function. I look at plants in this big broad term as being the link from the below ground world to the above ground world. And when this cycle is working correctly, you have plants that are essentially taking um, carbon and oxygen out of the atmosphere. They're bringing it down through their leaves and into the roots, you know, with photosynthesis. They're moving it into the soil to feed all the microbes that are in that ground. All the microbes in the ground are what build the organic matter, improve the soil structure, and cycle the nutrients back to the plants. So when this is working, this is how we build soils, and it happens over eons of time. So when we move into an area or we don't have this going on, it's construction destroyed, construction altered soils, uh, the way we restore them is getting this compost back in there, getting organic matter. I'm not real picky about what type of organic matter you use. If, you, if you're fortunate enough to have it in your backyard, or if you live in an agricultural community where you have farm waste available to you, whatever works for you, whatever is readily available to you, you should use. It's all good. But I put in this little plug, my favorite, if I'm going to say what's the one that I should use, I'm always going to be recommending bumper crop. A bumper crop, I sort of stumbled on, this is actually my third year of using it. Uh, it's been around much longer and that just took me a while to, um, to give it a try. But bumper crop, they're taking, you can see worm castings, lobster, crab shells, kelp meal, aged bark, dehydrated manure, on and on. They're taking all of these different forms of compost, blending it together and putting it all in one bag for us. So this gives us a really diverse composition of different forms of compost, supports a diversity of uh, biological life in the soil. It also has seen some dolomitic lime in there to pH balance it. It's got mycorrhizal supplements, which is a specific uh, group of fungi that are in there, and it's all certified organic. So there's, like I said, I don't want to get you hooked on one item, but if there was just one kind of general all-purpose, best-performing composting, this, in my experience, is right there at the top of the list. I became a believer, really, this goes back, I think, about three years ago when I first started. I grew up in pots and containers I mentioned on my deck. I'm a townhouse, don't have that much space and don't have much sunlight. Um, so I'm growing an earth box up on my deck. And essentially, as I'm rejuvenating, renewing that potting mix each year, uh, this particular year, I because I'm always experimenting, which is, again, the joy of gardening, I mix bumper crop into the, into the soil, into the pots. Well, that year, as you can see, I'm, people know me, I'm about six foot two. So the tomato you're looking at there is getting close to seven feet tall. That one tomato plant yields me 70 tomatoes. I'm like, well, what happened? The only thing that really happened um, was I changed the soil composition. 
So ever since then, I've continued to use the bumper crop credit that I've almost quit growing tomatoes though, because of uh, the squirrels get way more of them than I do. Um, so then I start putting more emphasis on growing peppers because uh, I just had the squirrels don't seem to bother them. Again, this is just one earth box it has three pepper plants. This was my second harvest of peppers out of there. So I'm going like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If my quick counts is like nine peppers up there in the rear. And never mind, that's my second harvest. So I think I end up with these three plants getting about 17 really nice, wonderful peppers out of this one planter box. So that's kind of my, my personal testimony um, out there. And that's of course, tomatoes and peppers are some of the most popular vegetables for people in home gardening. So I'm gonna talk about these. And again, this being the plant clinic, uh, the, the rest of my presentation, we'll be looking at insects, disease, and all the things that go wrong, but it's important we know about it. So tomatoes and peppers, again, warm season crops, like warm, sunny conditions. Uh, a lot of us don't, don't plant them until Mother's Day. Uh, maybe you can get out there in early May, but again, I think it's a little bit early for putting these out in the ground, because again, they want the warm conditions, the warm soil. So sometime within the next couple of weeks will be ideal for planting. Uh, they do need pretty much consistent moisture. If you bounce from extremes to wet and dry, wet and dry kind of cycles, a lot of times that leads to, especially as the fruit's maturing, you'll start getting cracking, splitting, um, disorders, physiological disorders go on there. So we, we want to check on them and keep that soil where it feels just like a damp sponge at all times if we're possible. Good air circulation. We'll talk about this because that we have disease problems, particularly tomatoes. There's entire volumes of books written about pathogens and diseases with tomatoes. One of the best things that we can do is just keeping the foliage dry, keeping good air circulation around the plant. So I really don't like to crowd these things in. I like to give them some room to grow. And we'll talk about all this right here coming up and, um, and how we can manage some of these problems that show up. Because um, it's worth the effort that puts into it, again, because nothing like a homegrown tomato and fresh stuffed peppers, but uh, things like blossom end rot, late blight, uh, septoria leaf spot, we're gonna talk about that coming up. I'm going to first begin with blossom end rot, which is a physiological disorder. This is not a pathogen. It's not an insect. It's not a disease. This is classic to what I was describing about. As that fruit is maturing, as it's ripening and expanding, it has to have a steady, consistent supply of moisture, and it needs sort of a steady, consistent supply of calcium available to it. If we allow the plants to go into a drought stress and then water them. During that drought period, basically it shuts down the transport of calcium. If the calcium is not in the soil, then that becomes a problem. So this is one of the reasons with any time when we're planting tomatoes, and especially if we're growing them in containers, that we like to add some lime into that soil to make sure that the calcium is available in the soil. Because in a, in a flower pot, it can only access the nutrients that you put in there. So things like the bumper crop has calcium in it. Um, a lot of organic fertilizers will contain it, but just make sure that you have adequate calcium in there to start with, and then also continue to monitor moisture and it will keep you out of trouble with this kind of thing. Um, and you can see how it's always at the far end of the fruit um, because that's just not getting the calcium and it starts to rot. So it looks like a disease, but it's actually physiological. The worst disease problem that we deal with is called late blight. Uh, late blight's what we call a water mold. It moves, it spreads, and infects the plant through moisture. So the most important thing I can say on this is that we really want to make sure that, this, that we keep the plants dry. Um, if that foliage stays wet for an extended period of time, uh, day after day, or for many hours at a time, if that water stays sitting on the plant, that provides an opportunity for that pathogen to gain in there. The spores can exist either in the soil or they can disperse and move through the wind from plant to plant. So this is back to, I'll show you pictures, but culturally, what we really wanna do is maintain a clean environment, good air circulation, manage our water to prevent 
prolonged periods of wetness uh, so that we can set ourselves up for success. If we run into this problem, even if we do all the right steps, but let's say the weather is just not favorable and we hit three days of rain and cloudy and it's wet and you start to run into this problem, that's when you might have to think about reaching for a fungicide, but we try to stay out of that situation. Uh, septoria, this is a fungal leaf spot that we saw a lot of last year. Again, this is uh, warmer conditions at 60 to 80 degrees with very wet or moist conditions. So you start to see a commonality in all this. Pretty much all these fungi, or most of them we deal with the fungi and the water molds and stuff, require a moist surface to, to actually infect the plant. So culturally, this is what I like to do. This is back in an old garden. You can see it's an old picture, but when I had more space available to me, this is one of the reasons I like to stake tomatoes or cage them so they're up off the ground. Ideally, I like to space them out so they have plenty of sunlight around them, good air circulation, they're not in contact with each other. And I emphasize there where the ground is covered. In this particular garden, I was able to put soaker hoses out that water the ground, not the, not the foliage, and put a straw mulch cover over it to prevent splashing because it, this is a pathogen, can splash from the soil up onto the plant. Uh, I'm emphasizing it because late blight kills plants. It doesn't, it's not just ugly, it's not spots or blemishes, but it's a killer. It's probably the number one reason people get depressed with their tomatoes when they start dying. And I really believe it's completely avoidable just by providing the right growing conditions, restraining ourselves from crowding them in and, and giving the plants what they need to grow. Uh, if you do get into problems, it's hard to manage. I could talk to you about fungicide options, but, but nobody really wants to be out there spraying their plants anyway. Um, moving along, uh, cucumbers and squash. Every time I'm talking with parents coming in and gardening with their kids, Every kid I talk to, you know, I start asking, well, what's your favorite vegetable? What do you want to grow? Every kid I know loves cucumbers, and cucumbers are a great plant to grow anyway of because they're productive, they're quick. You get this kind of immediate gratification that comes from it. Uh, you don't have to have a huge amount of space because cucumbers and squash, they're all cucurbits in the same uh, family, growing, same growing conditions. But these tend to be big vining plants. You know, they just trail on and on and on. And if you have the space, that's fantastic because they produce a lot and they're relatively easy to grow. Uh, I tend to grow, there are bush varieties. I think I even brought little seeds in here, or I meant to, forgot to. Uh, no, here we go. But the bush cucumbers. So what will happen is like bush cucumbers, and there's some squash varieties like this, they'll still give you the full size cucumber. I like the pickle type, so that's what you see here. These are uh, picklers, but it's a bush cucumber. I literally grow in pots on my deck, let it grow along the railing, and it will produce a full size cucumber, but the plant's shorter and more compact. Now, these guys, um, cucumbers and squash, they don't have a real long season. They love the summertime, but they have, kind of more than their share of pest problems also. We get fungal infections, like just expect it. You're going to have mildew problems. It's not gonna make it through the whole year without mildew. Uh, there's both the powdery mildew you see here, that white um, kind of discoloration powdery look on this top of the leaf. Downy mildew, you can't really see it. It's on the bottom of the leaf, but it's leading to the spots that are up here. Uh, so again, we want to just manage the moisture, good air circulation, good sunlight, try to keep the disease problems down. One of the techniques that I've had good success with, if you, if you have the space to do it, is to plant what I call sequential planting. So maybe I plant some cucumbers or squash. I wait two weeks to do a second planting. If you have the time and space, if you wait two weeks and do a third planting, that way, when your first crop kind of fizzles out, you just yank it and move on to the second one. When that fizzles out, you yank it and move on to the third one. Um, and that can extend your harvest. But again, that's if you've got a family or you really, really like cucumbers and squash. Squash vine borer is a major pest. It's a clear wing moth that you see here. It lays its egg in the stem and that larvae tunnels into it. This is a real bummer, particularly on squash, because again, the whole vine just wilts and dies. 
uh, stink bugs. Their mouth is like a little, like a little syringe. They poke it into the fruit. So they'll do this in to tomatoes, sometimes cucumbers, peppers. Uh, the plant bug, you can barely see it up there, is a major pest with herbs. It doesn't kill the plants, but it causes these spots, these blemishes, detracts from the beauty. These are all hard to control pests, just like these other beetles. So one to me, one of the most effective ways, uh, if it, again, if it fits into your gardening system, are these floating row covers. The floating row cover, it's synthetic fabric. It's, it allows air and sun and water to penetrate through it. It's so lightweight, it's like tissue. It doesn't crush the plants under it. And so what I'll do is just literally drape this blanket over the plant and it forms a physical barrier and it prevents cucumbers and plant bugs and vine borers and all these other hard to control insects from getting on there. It's just a protective cover. But to get pollination, when you see the crops reach the flowering stage, you do need to pull that blanket off and remove it so the pollinators can get in there to set fruit. But by that time, your plants are up, they're established, they're growing, they're so close to um, producing and harvesting that you've got a big head start on the, on the little bugs and critters. So that has been a great way to do it. Also, I want to just kind of quickly mention a little thing. I love to use the natural predators that are out there. So when you start finding ladybugs, ladybird beetles or ladybugs, however you want to call them, these are voracious predators. Not only do they bring good luck, but the adult will chow down on small insects like aphids that you see here. So that's the adult, but they go through a complete metamorphosis. So that adult beetle, she will lay eggs that are this bright, bright yellow. You can see them if you're looking for them. Uh, sometimes people bring them in wondering what it is, thinking it's a pest, but they're very distinctive in their size and color. They will hatch into this larvae. The larvae is also a voracious predator because uh, they are a lot of metabolism, a lot of growing going on. So they are eating all the other little insects, particularly like aphids, that again, are at the bottom of the food chain. So they're wonderful having there, keeping other pest problems under control. And then this is that pupil phase. You think of a butterfly that goes through like a cocoon stage. This is where they metamorphosize from being that larvae into the adult that's there. So I always want to make sure that you recognize all stages of the life because I, from time to time, is, and it's an unfortunate learning process, but I'll have people killing the larvae like this because they look, it's just a bug and people are concerned that they're eating their plants. I'm like, no, they are helping you. They're keeping pests under control. There's a lot of other sort of small or less glamorous predators that are out there. These naturally occur in our environment. They're native insects. Uh, we do sell ladybug beetles. We don't have them yet. Um, they won't ship them until we have warm weather so they don't die in transit. But we will sell ladybug beetles, for example, as a, as a way to supplement the population that exists. But we have things like flower fly that, again, is a larvae like this, is eating aphids. As an adult, it it's really a fly. People might mistake it for a bee because it's mimicking one, but it's just a fly and it eats pollen and nectar. Uh, there are parasitic wasps. And when I say wasps, this is tiny. It's the size of a gnat, but it's, it's preying on aphids and parasitizes them that we see here. So a lot of these insects as an adult might feed on pollen and nectar, but in their larval stage, feed on other insects. Tomato hornworm, common pest to tomato growers. It's, I mean, those, these guys get huge, but in this one, it's been parasitized. All these little cocoons, that's a barachnid wasp. Again, a little tiny gnat-sized wasp that has parasitized uh, this caterpillar. And that caterpillar, believe me, that caterpillar is not eating anything in your garden. It is done. It's just a matter of time uh, as the little parasites use that as their food. So we definitely wanna encourage these. That's why I think it's so important that we bring flowers. You might notice in pretty much every picture I show, I think it's really important that we incorporate flowers in with our vegetable gardens, that they are not separate uh, and segregated from each other. Uh, this is Peggy Beer's backyard, because again, she does just such a marvelous job 
looks a lot better than my garden, so I, I steal her picture, but you can see like she's got the allium in there and the nasturtium. So these are edible kind of herbs, but also the flowers are providing pollen resources for the different parasites and uh, parasitic and, and uh, I'm trying to think of predatory insects also. So mix all that up together uh, and that's going to definitely aid in your success. I think I'm going to stop right here, take questions and we'll go from there. If, um, if we have time, I got a couple more pictures, but otherwise, let's see, how are we doing, Daniel? We got any questions coming in? We do have questions. Let's see, let's pick up two here. All right, going from the top. Um, first question is from my good friend, Tina, uh, who I've known for quite a few years now. Um, she was wondering, uh, if planting in pots, uh, when planting in pots, should the soil be replaced each year or can it be used multiple years in a row? Yeah. So what I like to do, uh, Tina, is, and everybody has this question, I don't change the soil completely. I use this word, I replenish the soil. So I will probably keep about, I'm going to say roughly two thirds of my old soil, but I replenish it by stirring in my case, bumper crop or fresh potting mix into there. And maybe after about three, four years, something like that, I might do a total complete change, but you do not have to do it mm -hmm. annually. Mm -hmm. Great. Piggybacking off of bumper crop, we had a lot of people asking about this. Does an application of bumper crop, um, how long would that last for? Well, when you, when you say last, um, it breaks down at a rate of about organic matter, you know, any kind of compost breaks down at a rate of 50% per year. So think of it like this, that, okay, if I add one inch of compost this year, you know, maybe there's a half inch of that left the following year, maybe it's a, a quarter of an inch and so on. So it breaks down over a period of several years, a rate about 50% per year. As it's breaking down and decomposing, that's what's building the structure, that's what's feeding the microorganisms, and that's what's um, improving the, the soil and that cycling nutrients. I love to replenish the organic matter on an annual basis. Um, so each year, I'll add some more. It may, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a, a huge amount, but anytime I have an opportunity to kind of replenish that compost, I do. So if I'm planting something new or if I'm top dressing a garden, you know, normally once a year is a really good maintenance practice to follow. Wonderful. Uh, next question is about uh, your earth box. Um, They're wondering how big is the earth box planter that you use for tomatoes? So the, the earth box, they, they make two or three different sizes. Um, I've been growing in them for about eight years now. Uh, the, the standard earth box, the ones that I have, holds about two cubic feet of soil and the instructions tell you and it's designed for growing two tomatoes. Uh, I grow one tomato in there. What I found, my own experience, is if I put two tomato plants in there, these plants get big, they grow like this, kind of intertwined with each other and contact with each other, when they're in that environment, they don't get as much sun, there's not good air circulation, the productivity of the plant starts to go down and the disease problems are worse. Uh, so this is, this is discipline, I'm telling you, discipline. You go in there and you see six different kinds of tomatoes that you want to grow. And I'm trying to tell you to put one in each box. Uh, so, so the instructions will tell you to, and you can try that. Uh, I've kind of come to the realization that one earth box, one tomato. Now I will underplant that sometimes. And if we have time, I'll show you. So I'll do like an earth box and then maybe I put some lettuce or, or some basil or something smaller underneath of it. So I get more productivity out of it. But if we're talking a big plant like tomatoes, I, I really feel strong. You just gotta give them room to grow. Wonderful. All right. Next, uh, talking about more uh, vegetables and whatnot, is it too late to start planting with seeds 
or would it be better now to just start planting with uh, smaller plants? So there's a lot of things, and this is kind of why I brought these seed packets in with me. There's a lot of plants that will grow really quickly from seed. I'm talking like cucumbers, beans, squash, uh, corn, you know, if you have space. These, there's a lot of stuff that you could just wait, probably, again, maybe next week, the following week, depending on what our weather does, when the soil temperatures warm up some. And I'm saying like, just direct sow into the garden. Uh, it's more economical, they grow so quickly. It's the difference of maybe a one week between buying this and buying a transplant. Now there are other plants like tomatoes and peppers, they take longer to grow. If you were to start tomato seeds today, for example, you will probably be harvesting tomatoes in like August, September. Most of us want to be harvesting tomatoes in July, which means that you should probably buy a starter plant on that. So it, it depends very much on what you're growing, but things like tomatoes, peppers, I'm like, come in, we got we'll have a great selection of plants, you know, pick out the plants that you want, uh, grow them, you'll start getting an earlier harvest. If you want to grow from seed, go for it, but you just have to wait a while. Would uh, cucumber seeds, would those be ones that you would want to do seed now or do a starter uh, plant for that one. And if you did it in the seed, would it be better to do it inside to start? It's it's not really a question of what's better. Again, I, I am all about, I, I grow cucumbers from seed. You can go from a seed to germination in about one week. So when you come in to buy a transplant, the transplants are probably two to three weeks old. So I'm telling you, basically you decide what's more important to you. If you if you just need one or two plants, it might be easier for you to just buy a transplant. Somebody's already got up and going and you get a two or three week head start on there. Uh, of course, seeds are always a better value. Some, um, and so if you need a lot of plants, maybe you grow from seed, but both methods work equally well. Um, I don't, you, you could start seeds indoors and you could do that now. So they're ready to plant out in two weeks from now. Um, so that's also a totally legit option if you want to start them yourself. Wonderful. Um, next uh, couple questions are about adding calcium to the soil. Um, are eggshells a good source or bone meal um, or is there a no better option? So these are all good sources of calcium. Of uh, my one, one of my hesitations or part of my, I, I mentioned my number one nemesis is squirrels. I've gotten where sometimes I'm reluctant about putting anything like, you know, bone meal, you know, in, in the soil because I think sometimes it attracts wildlife to get intrigued with the smell and start digging around in there. Eggshells, again, are a very good source of calcium, but they really need to be composted down to make that calcium available to the plant. So like if you're mixing eggshells into your compost, it ages, it degrades and breaks down, then that calcium becomes available to plants. But if you just take eggshells and toss them into your garden, it's probably going to take about a year before that calcium is really soluble and available to it. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get calcium, whether it's lime, gypsum, uh, like I said, bone meal, eggshells. It's, it's available a lot of different ways. Uh, I just, I guess I'm talking circles, so I'm saying, yeah, I'm all about bone meal, uh, eggshells, but I like to compost them first. If you don't have the time to do that, then get some lime or gypsum in there as a more immediate source. All right. Um, going to that cover that you were talking about, the, the floating row cover, um, mm -hmm. one of our attendees was wondering if that cover would be good to protect um, uh, their blueberries, like if they would still be able to ripen under that cover um, and still protect them from birds. Yes, yes. Um, again, I brought it in. It's called the Harvest Guard. This is the actual trade name that it goes under. Uh, it's very, very light tissue paper. The thing that you have to kind of be aware of is like we're talking about blueberries, the insects must have access to the flowers to pollinate them first. So you would have to leave the plant open and available and 
after the fruit was set, you know, where the fruit was expanding, uh, then you could put a cover like this over to keep it, the birds away from it. So yes, you can certainly use this. It does help to deter wildlife. You know, with this cold weather, I'm also gonna say it traps a little bit of heat. It's not quite the same thing as frost cloth, but I think it keeps about maybe half a degree warmer under the cloth than it does out of there. So I will get multi-purpose use out of it. Um, both, like I said, it can help keep wildlife off. It can help to keep insects off is my primary interest. Um, and it can also help a little bit in terms of protecting from the cold. Gotcha. Uh, next, going uh, talking about the late blight that you were talking about. Once that sets in, um, would ventilation help or would you need more of a fungicide to uh, combat that? Yeah, good, good ventilation, good air circulation stuff may help to prevent the spread to other plants. But once the plant's infected, it's infected. Uh, and we don't have a good way to control that. So even if I start saying like fungicides, and I brought this in, copper is probably the most widely used one. Copper, uh, a lot of gardeners use this because it's, it's approved for organic gardening. It's a natural product. It's only what I'm gonna call somewhat effective. So let's pretend if I have late blight showing up um, and my tomato already has fruit on, if I'm spraying it, this may help to protect the fruit from getting rotten, but the plant's infected. Uh, so it's either can be applied as preventative measure, provide applied very early on um, at the first signs of symptoms. It's not really going to reverse the infection. It can't cure it, but it can help in preventing the spread. I'm going to add to that. I've I've never grown these. I've heard, never actually seen, but I've heard that there's some blight resistant varieties. Uh, that's something I need to learn more about. I think some of those might even be engrafted tomatoes, but mm -hmm. that's a fairly new introduction. It's nothing that we sell or have at the garden center, but it might be something worth looking into. Wonderful. Well, we got uh, just a few minutes left. Let's do a, just a couple more questions. Um, this one is more of a clarification. Um, the flowers that you were planting near your vegetable garden, what were those ones again? If you could state those again. Oh, I plant all kinds of things, but let me tell you what I think is best. Uh, these these uh, wasp and flies, they're parasites and predators. They're very small and they want to nectar on small flowers. So anything that's in the carrot family, uh, so I'm talking about uh, like dill, fennel. I love throwing those in my garden because I don't necessarily eat a lot of dill or fennel or even parsley, but butterflies like to feed on the foliage of those. Uh, swallowtail larvae will eat them as, uh, you know, just for butterflies. But they also have these little tiny blossoms on it. They're very attractive to the pollinators and stuff. So uh, it, I think in that picture, we showed some allium. I think those were just chives, which chives, again, have a place in the herb garden. But when they flower, that's very attractive. So I'm not necessarily looking for big showy blossoms. Again, nothing wrong with that. But try to think small, think tiny. So anything that's in the carrot family, I love having yarrow in the garden. You know, if it perennials work, yarrow is a phenomenal plant uh, for providing those small nectaries in its beautiful garden. So, so anything, any any composite, meaning things like zinnias, even uh, you know things that have a flower that's like a daisy are wonderful to include. Wonderful. All right, so I have one more question before we close out, and uh, this is: uh, When is the best time to start building a vegetable garden? Well, about a month ago, no, but, but really, uh, so so we want to start today. You are not too late. I said jokingly, we uh, we've got a pretty long growing season here in Virginia. Our summer season, which really is often starting for us in May, who knows? Them, but we've got May all the way through September, so we've got a pretty long season for warm season vegetables. So we do really well around here with tomatoes and peppers and squash and corn and the warm season stuff. It's the cool season things. Our spring and our fall season is usually kind of short or compressed. So I, um, cool season stuff, I like to plant for a fall harvest. I really prefer that as a fall crop. And then um, 
And you can start any time now. Like I said, within the next couple of weeks, it's perfect for these warm season vegetables. Wonderful. Well, thank you for uh, uh, all the information today. I know everybody uh, really got a lot of nice comments from people excited to be able to watch. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close out? No, we could keep going on this all day. I just try to kind of get the stuff that I think is relevant and important out there. But again, you know, anytime you have questions, uh, reach out to us. You can send uh, questions in through the chat function here, like, like Daniel was telling you through our comment section on the website. I'm here at the Fair Oaks store Monday through Friday. I work down at the Maryfield store on Saturday, so stop by to see me. Um, and of course, I work that team of really great people. We're all here to kind of to help out with this. And we've got a, a nice selection of these vegetables and stuff in stock now. So stop by anytime. We're here to help. Wonderful. Well, thank you, David. Um, once again, for people who did not get their questions uh, answered, we only had a few left. Um, so, uh, but if, if you didn't get your question answered or if you remember one later, um, be sure to uh, either email Sally at sbros at mgcmail.com or to reach out through me to uh, through our website at uh, maryfieldgardencenter.com, the contact us form. Um, until then, uh, next time, we'll see you in another two weeks. Um, and everybody have a great uh, day. Hopefully you guys are uh, staying warm in this cold weather and uh, stay warm tonight. <laughs> <laughs>